Hey folks, my name's Kevin and it's time for a little bit more knife nerdery, but if I'm being completely honest, I think this is going to turn into a lot of bit more knife nerdery. I might even need to split into two because today we're doing something I've never done before. We're going to do a full state of the collection video. And at this point, the collection's gotten a little bit out of hand. <laughs> I think this is a perfect way to celebrate though, because today is the one year anniversary of making this YouTube channel. I think I actually created the account two days earlier, but this is the one year anniversary of when I uploaded my first video. And everything about that is absolutely wild to me. I cannot believe it has been a whole year. Uh, honestly though, I can't even believe that I have a YouTube channel. I can't believe that people subscribe to me. It, everything about this craziness. And if you had told me that I was going to make a YouTube channel. I also never would have expected it to be about pocket knives of all things, but I'm really glad that this is how things turned out because I've had such a tremendous experience this last year getting to nerd out with so many cool people. I've also got to experience a bunch of cool knives, but the big thing is that I've got to meet some really amazing people in this community. I've made some good friends and I've just experienced some wonderful generosity. Everything about this has been just such a cool experience that I know I wouldn't have had if I hadn't tried making this channel. So I want to thank the people who helped encourage me in the first place. There was a bunch of folks in the TRM Facebook group and Marianne herself that, that said, hey, you should give this a shot. And my friend Dan kind of walked through things with me and helped me figure out if I could actually do this in a way that was sustainable. And it's tough. It's tough. It really is. Sometimes the grind is hard. And uh, I mean, early on, there was an entire month gap where I didn't upload anything because of just how difficult it is to find time for this kind of stuff. Um, so honestly, there's a degree to which the YouTube channel didn't really pick up until more like September or so. So there's another part of it that doesn't feel like it's I've really been doing it at this like rate and everything like that for a full year. But uh, the whole thing still just absolutely blows my mind. But thank you to everyone who has spent this last year nerding out with me. This has been amazing. And so what we're gonna do is when I look through all the knives uh, I have in my collection right now. And part of the reason for that is because I need to start purging, man. I, things have gotten out of hand. I need to sell a bunch of knives just to be able to literally to afford, let alone have space for um, being able to continue bringing new stuff in. Cause I. I'm constantly trying to check out new things just from my own curiosity, but also because I want to make videos about it. And if I'm being completely realistic, I think a lot of the stuff that's in my collection right now is stuff that I haven't moved on specifically because I've not yet found the time to make a video about it. And it's not like it's, I got stuff because I, because I thought it'd make good content or something. I got it. I got knives because they were interesting to me for some reason or appealing to me for some reason, but that's the same general criteria of what I want to make content about. And so, yeah, um, I, I don't know how many of these things will still be around the next time I do something like this. I, I think we'll probably see a lot of change. Some stuff will definitely stick around and I'll probably highlight that, but I'm going to try to keep this quick. I think what we're going to do. So, like not everything lives in these cases behind me. And at this point, certainly not everything even fits in the cases behind me, which is scary. Um, but I think what I'm gonna do is turn this to be tabletop and then bring over about a drawer worth at a time, lay things out and try and keep it relatively short to like, what even is this? Why did I get it in the first place? Kind of thing. Um, uh, someone joked that it might be a full seven hour video cause I'm a talker. Um, I'm going to try to keep it less than that, but I don't know. We'll see. We'll see where it goes. Anyway, thank you guys again for the last year of just nerding out with me and uh, yeah, let's get going. Okay. We're going to start things off with some odds and ends and then some budget knives. And then we're going to work our way up from there. Generally, you'll, you'll notice pretty darn quickly that I just don't have that much in the budget space. And I have a small number of things in the high end space. And most of my collection is going to be living in that kind of middle ground, which I guess to some people would be high end, but it's kind of the high end of like budget stuff. I don't, I don't think I own, we'll get there when I get there. I don't think I own anything that counts as like a handmade custom. I don't know. Anyway. Um, yeah, so I'm going to try my best to keep this relatively quick and just stick to what these are, um, and why do I own them and not go into too much about what I actually think about them, but we'll see. I like to ramble. We're going to start off with three things that I truly did buy just for the channel. I would have never bought them otherwise, um, partly because they're crappy, but, uh, actually this one's not crappy. Anyway, this is a Ontario knife company ice wraith. And I got this because I don't own any other lockback knife. And this having the clear handles is a perfect way of being able to demonstrate the mechanism of a lockback without having to actually disassemble a knife. And it's just, 
it's also just legitimately kind of cool getting to see it move like that. Um, as a knife, it is garbage. Okay, these both are my attempts to find the absolute cheapest axis lock knife that I could for a video that I'm planning on doing all about how axis locks themselves work. And also I wanted something really cheap because I'm planning on modifying it for a kind of idea I have. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go too far into that. I don't want to spoil anything, but I wanted something that I knew if I, I would feel okay destroying if I, if I accidentally did destroy it. Um, and I kind of already did that. So this is the Gerber Sumo and man, I, this thing, I hate it. I hate it so much. It's got some things that are kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, you'll see right away that, well, it's, it's a big old boy, but yeah, man, there is just so much garbage blade play in every single direction. And the big thing is I got this, like I said, to be able to take it apart, look at it, show what's going on inside and then modify it. And that only works if you can take it apart. And I cannot for the life of me disassemble this thing. I stripped six, I think six different WIA T8 bits trying to get this open. And you can see that I have torched the G uh, G10 around the outside of this, trying to heat this up to break whatever kind of Loctite they have in here. So this is now just a beater piece of garbage that I have, and I hate it. This was my next attempt. And so um, there are a lot of cheap Axis Lock clones out there. Um, what are they called? I forget what they're called, but there's that there's that company that put, makes the like take an exact Ontario rat and just put a lock bar on it. And I, I was trying really hard to not give money to a literal clone. And this is obviously trying to like ape the, the bug out in general, but there is, uh, it's got a fundamentally different handle shape, but it's, yeah. So this made me feel okay about it. Um, and the thing is, is that this is actually not bad at all. This free tiger brand, whatever the heck that is, that's such a, a weird and delightful kind of Englishy name. But, um, this knife is actually legitimately really nice. It has no blade play. Uh, the action is really, really good. It's free fall right for out of the box. And this cost me, I think, 20, 20 bucks, something like that, 25 bucks. And this is one of those things where like, yeah, look, perfect centering. There's obvious substantial differences between this and something like the Hogue Ritter or up then even more price point to an actual Benchmade. There's obvious price differences, but I am blown away by the fact that a, a normal old person can get this in D2 for 20 something bucks these days. This is so much better than what you could get for that money um, when I was first looking at knives. Um, this is certainly not a budget, but it's my only fixed blade. So to me, it is an odd or an end. This actually just showed up on the channel. This is the BMKT field spec, yeah, the EDC1 field spec. It is a small, thin, light, perfectly well-balanced, delightful EDC fixed blade that I plan on using in my yard predominantly and or taking out into the uh, field with me. So this is not budget or what other people would consider an odd or an end, but to me it is my collection. This is definitely an odd <laughs> side of the odds or an end. This is something that I've had since it came out. Like, uh, I, I don't know how many years this has been out, 18 years or something like that. I got this ages and ages and ages ago. And it's entirely because this is a weird gadget knife. This is the Ed Van Hoy snap lock patent pending back at the time. That's how old this particular version is. And the way that this works is there's this singular frame and you then press down on this lever arm here, which pivots that upward and it's wider at this point than it is at that point. And so that pushes the frame apart and allows you to spin this in place. Yeah, so this is not in any way a practical knife. You could use this. I've don't think I've ever once used it, but I just love the fact that it is a weird mechanical gadget in sculptural art, and that is why I still own it to this day. All of the other knives that I had from that era, which were pretty much junk, I think I, I got rid of, or they were living in some kind of shame box in a cupboard. Um, like I have, I have one of those OTF lightning, <laughs> lightning OTFs. Um, yeah, shame cupboard. Okay. Those are my odds and ends. Now we're moving on to budget knives. And I, Genuinely think this might be all of my budget knives. There's a couple things that I'm going to fall into another category because they're going to be small knives, but 
This is my Franken Elementum. So I took the smaller, thinner blade S35 VN version of Elementum and swapped it for the uh, with the handles of a the Gabersha or Ro uh, it's an African rosewood, it's also known as Babinga. Um, version that was on a black blade originally. And the reason is because, honestly, I really liked the look of the Ferrum Forge uh, Mass Drop Gent that came in a S35 and Rosewood, but I liked the fact this was hollow grind and a thinner blade stock, and so even though I think the, the lines on the Gent are just better all around, and this is just kind of blobbier, um, I knew that I wanted to have an Elementum just to experience it, since everyone is such a phenomenon, but also I keep it around because it is kind of the quintessential budget knife and this is the best possible version of it in my for my particular taste and opinion um, and so just to be able to like know and reference and consistently remind myself of what a Civivi action is like that's generally speaking why I keep that in um, similarly this is the Civivi Altus I bought this off of left EDC and I got this to experience what a proper budget version of a button lock would be like, especially with one on thumb studs. I keep it around because I think Kev charged me like almost nothing for it, but it's also just fun to fidget with. And I think I might end up keeping this as my only button lock. We'll see going forward. Um, I think I only have one other, but I, I probably will let go of that. Sticking with things. Okay, this is the... Artisan Cutlery, uh, small Arian, Arian, I'm not really sure. It is a the Cerberus Knives collab that they did. And this one I got because I absolutely adore the color of this micarta. I think this is the third one that I've owned. I bought one off of a friend and two off of the swap and I've sold two of the three. And it's just because um, I don't really need it, so I keep selling it, but also there's just, these knives all have some kind of slight amount of grittiness feeling as the balls are rolling over the small little hole. And so I keep on thinking that if I just get the right one, then I'll get one that feels perfect because not everything from Artisan has that. Uh, but yeah, I just love the look of that micarta. And overall, even though I'm not really a spear point blade person, I think this knife is just pretty badass looking. So the next up, we've got, this is the... Ooh, God, what is this called? Ferrum Forge something, something. It's the Civivi something by Ferrum Forge. I am blanking what this is, but I bought this because I love Ferrum Forge's designs. I wanted to check out what it would look like and a to have Ferrum Forge in a Civivi. Um, I also really wanted the fact that, to see the fact that they have a loop over in ta attach internally pocket clip. That's just something really rare and pretty cool. And I also wanted to see how this double D10 is being implemented. And I got, so I got this in part to do a video all about how double D10s work because they all kind of do the same thing, but they implement them differently inside. Um, you've seen a taste of that already if you watched my video on the Vero Neuron that I put up recently because I did talk in there about how different knives do double detents, but I didn't disassemble all those other knives. Uh, one of the things that's cool about that is you can middle finger flick that if you flick off of the the, uh, blade like that. This as a knife is not a good knife because of how absurdly easy it is to break the opening uh, that detent. But if all you're doing is something really, really minor, I guess it would probably be okay. And I'm spending too much detail on these. Okay. Anyway, moving on. This is the Kvist Blade Works Variant PE. This is a spectacular budget knife. I, I, I think, I think everyone should own this if they need a budget knife. Um, as long as you're willing to accept a swayback handle. It's not a super pronounced swayback handle, but some people just don't like swaybacks, period. I will say even with me, it's not, I don't like swaybacks uh, as my favorite handle type, but this just feels so great. It's such a good slicey knife. Um, the uh, PE2 pre-order just went through, and when that comes in, I'm either gonna sell this because I don't see why I need it, everything about the PE2 is just a slight an upgrade, or I might actually um, give this away because it's such a good knife, and I know some people that need a knife. The high end of my budget space, this is the Ferrum Forge uh, Stinger in the marble carbon fiber. And I I never use this anymore just because I have so many knives and I just don't just don't need it. But I keep it around because it's a good example of what a like nice, a nice budget knife can be. This is 
a really, really good version of a budget knife. And I know that some of these, I think with the marble carbon fiber, they, they bumped just over the $100 price point. And so some people that pushes that out of the budget price range, but you can get these for much cheaper. And I just think overall, if, if, you, if you're if you okay with how pointy this looks, then this is just a great, great, great recommendation for the budget space. Okay, now let's look at our, our sea of tiny knives. I put Anything that's two and a half inches or under, I don't think I missed any, but we'll find out. Anything that's two and a half inches or under is on the table right now. And so as a result, we're kind of breaking some of the low to high thing going on because like that's a very expensive knife. That's pretty expensive too. Um, but let's go through this. Up first, we've got the Civivi Baby Banter. And this has just undoubtedly got to be the single best budget small knife that's ever been made. If you need a small knife, or if you just want a small knife and you can have a locking one, especially if you don't want to spend a bunch of money, I cannot recommend anything more than this. This is so freaking good. Even if you can spend a bunch of money, you, this, this is good enough that it's worth having, even if you can afford some of these other things. This is just, Ben absolutely nailed it. The action on this is spectacular, and the build is spectacular, and everything about this is just... Wow, really, really dang good. Okay, moving down. This is the Spyderco Native in S90V. This is the version, a sprint run that was in full carbon fiber, not that like peel of carbon fiber on top of G10. I got this because I didn't own anything in S90V at the time, and I also um, didn't own any other full proper compression locks. I just had the Spyderco Smock. So I wanted to be able to use this as a reference in videos for how compression locks work. I never use this. It came to me used, I bought it and got a good price on it, but I never use this, and it's just because Two, two things. One, um, something that I've seen on larger spider codes, but never on the little natives before, is that this little tab on this particular sprint run sticks out right here. And I hate that. I hate that so much because it means that when I go to close it, if my finger's right there, it's doing that. It's not closing. It's bouncing off my finger. I hate it. Hate it. But the bigger thing, the reason why I never use this is because even though ergonomically, this is one of the best knives for getting a full uh, four finger grip on a small knife. I personally hate these like just flat slab crisp corner things. These, these brick handles that Spyderco does. And so if this had the kind of like contoured aftermarket scales, I've seen them make for some other models. Um, I would, I would probably use this more frequently. The other thing is that Spyderco, uh, they, they, advertised, I think maybe at like SHOT Show, that they have a, a Warncliffe version of the Little Native coming out this year. And so I would probably pick that up and use that to replace this as my example of a uh, compression lock in the collection. Okay, down here, these I got, well, I got this one initially just because it's a really, really nice little um, box cuttery knife, and I thought it'd be a good competition for the McBee, and it is. If you need a small box cuttery knife and you want something that's just like just like the one inch kind of range and you're, you can have a locking knife, I cannot recommend this enough. This is the best tech tulip. But I got these other three because all th four of these are basically the exact same design from O Stop Hell, but implemented, I mean, there, there's obviously a difference here, but it's implemented from two different companies at two different price points and with two different things. And I thought it'd be a really cool video to be able to talk about what happens when you take roughly the same design and just change one or two variables at a time, because these are both full titanium, these are both G10, these are both locking, these are both double detent, these are both front flippers, these are both top flippers. And it's just really neat to get to see what happens as you vary those. And so, yeah, if you want a small and locking knife, oof, that is good. If you want a small and non-locking knife, also very, very good. If you want a budget non-locking, I think this is okay, but the problem is, is that for the exact same money as this, you can get this. So if you're permitted to have a locking one, this is just so much better. This is the everything about the build quality of this is just so meaningfully better than this one. And this is in uh, 14C 28N instead of 9CR. And so, yeah, this is anyway, these are cool. These are the best tech tulips, and this is the Civivi Kiwi. Staying with that tiny little size, okay, let's see if I can flick this on my first try. 
Eh, that counts. Um, this is the Spyderco McB, and this is a knife that I have kind of a love-hate relationship with because on the one hand, I think this is the single best box cuttery knife of all time ever made. And once it's open, I think it's the best thing ever. Getting it open is not tremendously fun. It is not, it's just not fun to flick. And this pops up in a way that means that you just can't get in here. And it's, wow, it's such, such a weird thing to flick in the first place. And then what's this, what's the knife with a spidey hole if you can't flick it? There's other stuff about this. I'll make a full video because it really is a love-hate relationship. I absolutely adore the parts about this that I like, and I absolutely loathe the parts about this that I hate. But overall, I still think this is one of the absolute best fifth pocket knives ever. But relatedly, um, so actually I should have prefaced the, the whole thing that some of the stuff that you're going to see in today's video is stuff that never made it onto the channel, like that never made it onto the channel. Some of it's because it predated me having the channel. Some of it's because I just didn't bother filming an unboxing video. Some of it's because I did film video content on it and just hasn't been edited and gone up yet. And this is a perfect example of that. This is going to be going up pretty soon. This is the new Micro Apache. I'll probably bring this back out when I bring out other penny knives, but this thing is such a freaking good uh, fifth pocket knife. And I think... I think these are going really underrated at the moment. I don't think they're really selling super well, but oh my God, if you need a small fifth pocket knife, or if you need a, a knife that has a, a short blade length because of some kind of legal requirement, this is so freaking good. This is a near perfect small box cutter utility fifth pocket knife. It is so freaking easy to use. I cannot get over it. The only thing that's a problem with this is that it is the price because this is the same cost as a full size Pena knife. And this uh, limited edition in fat carbon is even more money. Uh, I did that because I'm silly. But so yeah, like right off the bat, cheapest knife on the table. I and well, no, that is cheaper. But cheapest knife on the table and one of the best ever, most expensive knife on the table, one of the best ever. Keeping with things that are a little bit higher end, this is the Giant Mouse Ace Riv. This version uh, is a tie frame lock. I think they all are, but this was the version with micarta. And I got this one, even though I don't like OD Green micarta very much, because the full tie version didn't have a stone wash. And maybe someday I'll do a blade swap on those, but I love the stone wash. The one consequence of that, so it makes the flicking on this spectacular. That stone wash knocks down off the little like crisp edge right there. And it's the, the, the middle finger, finger flicking action on this is some of the best you'll find period. And that's on a tiny knife. Normally you have to have a reasonably large amount of blade for that to feel quite good. And so this is just stupendous and is so good at having a four finger grip on a tiny, tiny knife. But that stone wash means that they knocked down the jimping on here to the point where this flipper tab is garbage and it is really, really hard to use. It's really easy to slide off it. I hate, I, I, I someday might just grind that off because I hate that. But yeah, this is one of those things where um, if you want a small knife that is also incredibly sturdy feeling and feels like it's built like a tiny little tank, but it's still a really good slicer, cannot recommend it enough. Um, the exact same size, but now the exact opposite end in terms of tankiness, we've got two different TRM nerds here. So these are literally like the exact same dimensions um, at their thickest point. But actually now that they put the thinner scales on these, I think these are a little bit thinner. But this is tanky and this is featherweight, super thin and light. And this is the original version that has the thumb pad in here still. But this version is the one that I had sent off to knife modders uh, to have them cut in this hole. And thanks to a successful uh, con you know, attempt to convince her campaign to Mary Ann over at TRM, they're actually going to be like this going forward. So the next drop, which is happening in just a couple weeks, uh, somewhere towards the end of May, um, is going to have a slot, very similar to this actually, straight from the factory. And I cannot... I can't tell you how incredibly good it is once you have that. This thing is so slim and light. And I think for a lot of people, if they're going for a very small knife, there's something to put in their fifth pocket, especially like as a, a fifth pocket secondary to a, a much bigger knife, they probably want it to be something tiny that they honestly just forget about. But also if you are using something like, if you're wearing something like, a, like gym shorts and you need something that's very, very lightweight, this thing is so freaking good. And now that they have the hole, the action on it is the flicking on that is just perfect. So good. Um, I think if you can tolerate how slim this is, and some people just don't 
like that. Some people want a tanky nugget knife, but if you can, this is, I think, the best one on the entire table. I didn't intentionally put it dead in center, but it's kind of like that. Oh, uh, <laughs> the smallest knife, um, one of the smallest knives in the world and the smallest knife in my collection, this is the Ferrum Forge Micro Fortis, and this thing is just so... It's impossible to not, like, at least grin, if not full-on laugh when you open this up. This thing is so stupid tiny, but this is a full titanium frame lock with... Uh, ceramic detent ceramic ball bearings uh, nitro v steel with a from the factory mirror uh finish on that and everything about this is just i <laughs> i love it and the best part is that it actually does like work like you can hold it in this way and it feels pretty darn secure and in a pinch grip you can rest this like there and it just it actually is a functional knife, but it's designed to be a keychain knife. They, they they did the kind of thing where they made something that is kind of a gimmick, but then put in the the time and energy and resources to make it legitimate. <laughs> and I just love how much they're willing to put into something that is abjectly silly. Okay, moving over. This is the Best Tech Goblin, and I hate this knife. This is something that I've kept around because I've never included in a video and I've always wanted to do a lineup of tiny knives. Um, I got this because a bunch of people told me that it had um, some of the best uh, four finger grip on a small knife. And I will say, yes, in this one grip, this does feel really, really nice. And I understand that, but there's so many little things I hate about this knife, just little things about how it's done that that just bug the crap out of me. And some of them are just me being really, really obnoxious and persnickety. Like from a design perspective, you see how this chamfer here looks like it's continuing to the blade, but they didn't line those lines up. And so ugh, ugh, there's just so many little things about this that bug the crap on me, but you can flick off of that uh, stone washed uh, blade part down there and get a really nice middle finger flick. But otherwise, um, oh man, look at this. Who puts a, a uh, okay, look at it. This is a slot pivot, but it's it's uh, radius. And so it's really shallow on the outsides, which means you can't actually put a slot screwdriver in here uh, because it won't go in deep enough. You have to put in a really, really narrow one, and those aren't going to be tall enough. So it's going to—it's just—it's like looks as if it's meant for a dime, but or a coin of some kind. But it's way too small of radius for that. I just mm, so many little things about this bug the crap out of me. Okay, moving up here. This is the Alamic Busker. This is in the I think Semper blade shape. I don't remember, but it's—I got this one because it is just one of the best pinch grip knives on the market. I just absolutely adore this. But the reality is, is this particular build, because it's in their dark blast, is this that kind of like, is that kind of gritty, almost sandpapery. It's not rough and truly sandpaper. It's the kind that just makes my, it catches my fingers in a way. And so this is a really cool knife, but I'm gonna move it along at some point because it's just not the correct uh, busker for me. But buskers are really, really cool. Um, and I'll probably bring that back out when I bring out the other Alamic that I have. This here is the Vox Dapper. It's the first ever Blade HQ uh, ex like exclusive knife, that, or not exclusive, Blade HQ like branded knife. That's, that's their logo right there. So this is like Blade HQ brand, but it's made by, I think, Fox in Italy, and it is a collab with Jesper Voxnes. And I got this not because I like it in like an aesthetic perspective. I think it's cool looking, I guess, but I'm not a clip point person at all. But I got this because, you know, Vox is known for having really, really good ergos in a small compact factor, and that's cool, and that carries over here too, but he's not known for having innovative and kind of boundary pushing flipper tab and lockup designs. And But that's what's really going on here. This flipper tab is so strange. It's very far leaning forward. It has this kind of hooking quality to you. And the result of this is that this works so freaking well for getting leverage. You can kind of push right here and you have so much force. You maintain contact this entire way. This tiny little knife, this flipper tab, it gives you an astounding, astounding flick, but then it hides right here. And this is the kind of thing where the blade, the the like the liner lock is popping in on top of that. And if you look down from above, it looks like it is a compression lock, but it's not. This is a full regular frame lock. It's just hiding the frame lock portion up higher. And it's actually similar to the way that like the um, 
like uh, the lift concepts of Vaunt does it almost, but just everything is more exaggerated. And so I keep this around because someday I want to take this apart and show an actual video of how that's all lining up in there. It's just a really cool design, but I've never once used this. I don't like the thick, um, the thick Italian grinds, and I just don't really like clip points. And so once I make a video about this whole stuff in, in more detail, I'm sure that will leave the collection. Lastly is one of my favorite nugget knives. Let's see how I can flick that on the first try. It has a very, very strong lock bar, so that can be hard sometimes. This is the Berg Blades Mini Slim in the blue wash uh, handle, and they did it came in a bunch of different other patterns, but this is the stone wash in the blue. And I just adore nugget knives, and this is such a good nugget knife. Um, it's, well, it's such a good nugget. I don't know if it's such a good nugget knife. It's 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 a kind of a wedgy, big, thick blade. And so I, I think this, if you like really chonky, hefty something, and you want like a big hunk in your, in your hand, I think then this is going to be up your alley, but it's so nuggety and and like powerful on this lock bar that it's it's like um i don't know it's it's kind of ridiculous and it's just so far it's like the exact polar opposite of this yeah look at that that's that's bonkers and it's the other thing it's just delightful that these things are called a slim because they're just kind of chunky okay these are all of the tiny knives okay next we have up i would guess i'd call these kind of production knives that aren't made of titanium. I think that's probably how I am organizing this. Uh, so they're, they're handle materials, they're not all titanium. Uh, first things up, let's see. We have the Monterey Bay Knives Slayback. This is the version in Burgundy Micarta, and I have never once used this knife because I also have the full titanium one, and I just always grab that one, but I freaking love the color of the titanium, and so I could not help but get this because, man, the Slayback is just such a freaking good knife. I don't know if I'll ever find a need for it, or I might move it along. Um, similarly, the uh, Easy C 1.5 in the black micarta. This is another absolutely delightful, such snappy action, wonderful knife from Monterey Bay Knives. You can see I swapped a clip that looked exactly like that for a CVV deep carry clip. It does work because I personally like deep carry clips and Ray Laconico just hates them and uh, <laughs> he refuses to put them on anything. So anyway, these are both fantastic uh, knives from Monterey Bay Knives. I, I think I think they make spectacular stuff. If you haven't picked up their things, but you like sleek designs, go there for sure. Next up, we've got one of my very first knives I ever had in the collection. This is the Benchmade Mini Griptilian in 20CV. Uh, this is the sheep's foot version. And I keep this around because it is my only Benchmade remaining. I keep it around because it's one of my earliest uh, nice knives. And I keep it around because it's a good design of what Mel Pardew can do. And he passed away recently and that makes me sad. Uh, so yeah, that's a great little guy. I also use that as kind of my slightly harder use knife because it's got really good grip. It can work with gloves and the axis lock is very, very strong. Uh, over here, this is the Wii Eidolon. So I actually got this for free because I'm a member of the Apex Pass Around group. And um, whenever, uh, not always, but sometimes when manufacturers donate something to the Pass Around, they donate it, period. And they don't expect it back at the end. And often they'll do like a raffle of all the people that signed up to see it. And I just happened to be the one that lucked into getting my name called. And so I got to keep this. Why I asked to check it out in the first place is because I like Justin Lundquist a lot. I think he makes really cool, sleek designs. And I wanted to see a integral G10 knife. And so the construction of this is really, really cool to me. This is a liner lock and they've had to use a tiny, like if you think about this, the screws down there, the, the like the Torx wrench they had to use had to be L-shaped and so incredibly small to be able to fit in there and be able to screw in from the side because you can't take it apart. And so I thought it was a really, really cool knife. Uh, I liked it enough. The action is nice enough that I thought I might, might get one. And then I ended up accidentally, not accidentally, just randomly lucking into getting it. Um, and so that's really cool. It's actually on my collection. The other thing I really liked is that this is a, a milled tie deep carry clip. It's not the kind that is um, like fourth axis because this is bent here, but um, it's just really cool to see that. And then over to the right of it is something I did pick up because it's a very, very similar design. This is also from Lundquist. This is the Kaiser Delorme. And I, 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 the one thing I don't love about this is that it has a very not me, very pointy, spear pointy blade. 
Uh, and this one is a much, much more meat blade. This is a full on sheep's foot knife. I guess you could call that reverse tanto as well. And it's, it's also got like just kind of bonkers good action. It's just a good example of how even on the budget space, you can get something that just falls down with its own weight. Uh, I don't pick this up very often. This is something that hasn't made the, the unboxing hasn't made it onto the channel yet, but I did film this and it's, um, I don't pick it up very often. I think just because I have a trillion other knives there, this is actually pretty darn good. This is next up. We have the Wii Mote. This barely didn't make it onto the mini nice, um, section of the video. Uh, the number one complaint everyone had from this is that they expect it to be bigger. From the look of it, they thought it was going to be bigger and it's just not. So for me, this is a three and a half finger grip knife. And so since I have medium sized glove hands, a lot of people will find that just a true three finger knife. This is also all belly and that's not my favorite, but it does work really nice for draw cut slicing and it does have a low down enough tip and that belly isn't so deep that you can't use that. But my big complaint about this knife is I don't like this flipper tab. It is very sharp and this knife is very sensitive to lock bar pressure. Um, so if you accidentally put it right there, you can dig under this and then run right off and it's just, oof, it does not feel good to do that. But it has an incredibly snappy action when you get it. Um, I am not sure if I, I think I filmed an unboxing for this, but I don't know whatever happened to it because that would have been a very long time ago. I've had this for a long time. Uh, yeah, it also does a really strange thing right here where this entire front part is exposed. So if I do have that video, maybe I did post an unboxing for this. I honestly don't remember. Okay, moving on. Come down here. This is the North Arms Skaha 2. This is the one of the older versions from, and I didn't even notice this until uh, uh, I after I filmed the video, they put the production date right there as a little uh, kind of pseudo Easter egg because it's completely hidden when it's open. And this is, yeah, so this is one of the older versions when they were still doing the CNC stepped blades. I think, just think it looks really cool. And so that's why I got this. Um, and I got it. The other reason is because everyone talked about this being a just bonkers smooth action with a ridiculously snappy knife, uh, sorry, snappy open. And it really lives up to that so hard. This is really, really cool. This is a dad and his son in Canada making knives. And I, I have so much admiration and respect for them. It's a really, really, really cool knife. Uh, it's kind of impossible to get though. You have to get on the secondary like I did or sign up for their, their wait list. And it's like, it can, I've heard people say they got a whole year waiting list. I don't know how long, um, it is now. Uh, down here we have, or I guess all the four of these are button locks, if you will. And these three are different versions of the Spyderco smock. It is my favorite Spyderco and it is one of my favorite knives. This is the um, M390 Knife Joy, I think, exclusive version. And it is, I think, the best version that's out there. Um, this also is the best possible implementation. I've handled quite a few smocks at this point, and this one has the best overall action of any of them, including the fact that even with the second detent ball removed, this still has a very nice detent. It's light, but it's there. You come over here, this is the, not that one, this is the 20 CV version, which I think, I said that's knife joy. I don't know. This isn't, this is like, I think DLT. I might have those swapped, but this is another one that was a sprint run in the nicer steel. And this one has like no detent whatsoever. And that's how a lot of them are. And so I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Uh, I... I, I was thinking I might get it chopped down because the thing is, I don't need another full size one, but the, the ones with the better blade steel are really hard to come by. And I absolutely adore this. This is also started as a 20 CV. And this is the, uh, the version that was chopped by blade chops on Instagram. And the result is that this is a tremendously me shaped and sized knife. It is just one of the most fidgety knives. I adore this thing so much. It is spectacular. And the thing is, I love this blade shape, but I've also seen other choppers do a much more sheep's footy version, and I would love to have one of each. And so what I'm kind of thinking I might do is have this chopped and turned into a sheep's foot and then have two minis and one full size. Um, these are all pseudo button locks. They are compression locks with a nub that they are compression locks that are swapped around to be on the other side. So they would be like a lefty compression lock. And then they have a nub over it. This is a design that Kevin Smock came up with and it's part of this and the, um, 
the custom that he did, the S the SM23 or something like that. And that's basically the only people that did it. Very few other people have ever tried to implement a button over compression lock. There is a Russian company that I'm totally blanking the name on that implemented it and actually had to pay royalties. And then these days, uh, um, Craig Brown has implemented his own reimagining of a button lock over compression without even realizing that's what he's doing. He just invented a new novel locking mechanism and it's pretty similar, but definitely distinct from the compression lock. And it does have a button. It's on the other side. It's the whole thing. I can't wait to get one of those FSDs in hand and be able to talk about how he did that because his implementation of an adjustable, um, yeah, without having a detent there, his version of an adjustable detent is probably the coolest and most clever on the market. Anyway, uh, that's where that's going. This here is a true button lock. This is, of course, the Protec Malibu. And it's funny, like, uh, I've flipped this so many times, and that is all I've ever done with this. All I've ever done with this. I bought this because I wanted to experience the Malibu. I loved the fidgety nature of this so much that I bought the Thai one, and then I didn't like the actual implementation of the Thai one and the weight of it and everything like that, and so I sold that one. And I always figured I would probably sell this at some point, but then I never have. And so I showed earlier that I have that Civivi Altus, and I might finally get around to selling this knife and using the Civivi Altus as my example of how a true plunge lock button lock works. Um, but oh God, it's just, every time I think I'm gonna sell it, I click it again, and it just is so freaking fun to fidget with. Anyway, those are all these knives. Okay, we are sticking with production knives that are predominantly not made of Thai, excuse those ones, and we have two of my like micro collections. Over here we have all of my Peñas, and here we have all of my TRMs. To start off with, we have in this top left corner, yeah, look at this. So this is the large Apache in ebony wood with a, uh, a hand satin finish, and it's got these little pivot collars, and all of these little details, including the, la the lack of a nail nick there, makes this, I think, one of the most classy X-Series, and also one of the ones that looks the most like a true custom to me, and the action on it is just so much... Uh, it's just, it's the best X-Series action I've experienced, and I've experienced even more than the ones I own, and so that, yeah, this thing is just so freaking good that I, I think it's partly just the luck that this one is spectacular, but also the increase, a little bit of increased size there just makes the blade swing out with a little bit more oomph that just just fits perfectly. And speaking of fitting perfectly, I think the extra size here, this is a three inch blade instead of a 2.75 inch and the handles has been scaled up accordingly. And it's just such a perfect size. He needs to do more in this size because I think it is the ultimate version of the Apache. And the Apache is my favorite of his. Uh, you can see I predominantly own those. I got this off my friend Casper and I also got this off my friend Casper. So this, we already started with a an odd Apache because it's the only one that he's done large and it was also the, I think the only time he's ever done a wood scale on one of the X series. And then we come over here to something also like odd and, and uncommon in the X series. This is the Urban EDC Supply Series, sorry, Urban EDC Supply Company Co. Urban EDC Supply. Did they put a Co. at the end of their name? Anyway, Urban EDC Supplies Workerman Segaiha Wave Pattern Full Tie Frame Lock Version. Now, uh, all of the X series are available in a frame lock as one of the options, um, but it's the only one that I have like that. And one of the consequences of getting the frame lock is that the lock bar pressure is always much stiffer than you find on the bolster lock versions. And so this one is simultaneously one of my absolute favorites and one of my least favorites, because visually, I think this thing is absolutely stunning. It is so cool looking, but it has the strongest detent of any of them. And since Peñas in general have this style of flipper tab where it's all traction based. There's no geometry here. This uh, jimping has to be reasonably aggressive for you to get that traction. And with a strong detent, that's just, it, it honestly just kind of wears on me a little bit quicker. So um, I think maybe someday I will pop out this over travel stop and bend this out some and try and tune this to be a lighter like those because I think I would like it better as is it's my least favorite of the action it's also the most stiff on the clothes it's just like you definitely have to kind of wiggle at home coming from two weird apaches to yet a third weird apache this is so freaking cool yeah look at that flipper tab just disappeared so this this is a really neat thing. So this is a collaboration. So uh, what are they named? Uh, Steel Addiction Knives got together with Pena and worked on getting a three-way collab with 
the Lee Williams Kickstop design. So that's what what this is. It's a it's a free floating flipper tab. Let's get that out. It's a free floating flipper tab that then hides when the blade is open. And everything about this is just so freaking cool. Part of it, what's awesome is that it just, you don't get a flipper tab sticking out at the bottom. That's genius. It's just such clever engineering. But part of it is also that, wow, it's amazing. The action on this is just such an exceptionally good flipper tab action. Something about the way that this works, the fact that this, um, you, this slides freely and this is free floating, it gives you this almost kind of catapulty feel. And when this finally hits into place, it snaps with this really specific sound and feel, and it just feels incredible. This particular version isn't, so the, 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 the idea of getting a Pena with a flipper tab like that was something that, that Steel Addiction and I put together, but this particular one in the uh, fat carbon dark matter red handle pattern was also an exclusive to Steel Addiction Eyes. It's my favorite of theirs, but also I kind of wanted to support Steel Addiction for um, for arranging this whole thing. But one of the things that's also really cool about this is that they didn't um, limit it to them. They they got they let every kind of retailer get in on this. And so you could also get special editions from like Crane's Cutlery, where you could get um, fancy fat carbons. And with on that note, sticking with my sequence of uncommon Apaches, and I just mentioned Crane's Cutlery, here we have my newest addition to the Pena set. And this came up earlier in the micro uh, knife version, but in case you skipped right to this section, I freaking love this thing. So this is a Crane's Cutlery exclusive. They do these um, these like camo-esque versions of Fat Carbon as theirs exclusives. This one's called Lava Flow. This is another one from them that's called Jungle Wear. And this is... Oh, oh, I love it. I know it's it's gotten some people have been kind of making fun of this as like, oh yeah, when did you ever hold a, a you know an X series Pena and think, oh man, I wish it was even smaller. But the reality is, is no, this is the perfect fifth pocket knife. It is so freaking good. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, and yeah, you the the only real downside of this is the fact that it costs the same as a regular. Uh, a full size Apache or something like that, and so people, it just it, it doesn't quite feel like it's the same kind of value proposition. But my God, everything about the construction, everything is wonderful. And I personally paid a little even more to get this Crane's Cutlery version. I like Crane's Cutlery as a company, but I also just really like having fat carbon. Um, so I'm going to skip around and jump over to this one. This is a another, like I said, Crane's Cutlery version. This is something I bought off another friend of mine, and this is the Zulu. Now, the Zulu is my third favorite uh, X-Series Pena blade shape. My favorite is the Apache. My second favorite is what's going to be coming up on the Raptor. And this one is my third favorite because I think this is still a tremendously useful like utility EDC blade. It's got a lot of flat and a really low down tip. And so I do think this is great. The one thing that makes this not one of my absolute favorites is because I just will Personally, the kind of the end, the appearance of the end is it kind of slopes down here and I, I just doesn't look as like cool to me as some of the other ones, but I also just hate the way that nail nicks look. And so if I can get one without a nail nick, I'm going to like that. The one thing that does make this really cool, in addition, the other reason why I keep this around, of course, so while it's just because it's my only green knife. Green is one of my absolute favorite colors and you just can't find it on knives very often. And so while this version of Fat Carbon that they use is not my favorite, I prefer the Dark Matters over the Storm, uh, Arctic Storm and Lava Flow and whatever they call this series, uh, it's still really, really cool to have a green knife. The other thing that's really cool is that um, I think this is one of the only Pena knives where the 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 grind of the knife sticks up far enough from the handle that you can flick it open. And that's just tremendously fun. I've heard that lefties can also flick off of the kind of extra grip you get from those nail nicks, but on this one, you can just flick it. And that's just, yeah, that's just great. But my last one here, this is in some ways, I think the best X-Series Pena from like a functionality perspective, because what we've got going on here is the Raptor. And from a cutting perspective, this is one of the few ones that has a hollow grind and it's a really nice hollow grind. I know, like I think the Trapper and the uh, Swayback have that as well, but the hollow grind just makes this overall much slicer. They all have the exact same 0.12 blade stock, but that hollow makes it just glide into material so fast. But the other really cool thing that it's doing, if you look at this, the tip is angled down. This entire flat edge is angled like 
curved, uh, angled, yeah, that way, compared to the handle. And what that means is that in a pinch grip, this is doing the exact same thing that the McB is doing, where this whole thing is tilted downward in a way that's already set up for piercing. It's just so freaking good as a box opening knife. But the other thing that this is doing that just none of the other ones are doing, I talked about how this um, flipper tab design on the other ones is so low profile, but it means that you don't have any kind of geometry. You, there's nothing to push on. You can only pull using traction, but that's not the case over here. Look at that. I know it doesn't look as sleek as the other ones, but it kind of does line up nicely, perfectly fine with these angles here. But the big thing is that you can now finally push on this. And so you can use lever arm and, and actual like this, like from just a physics perspective, you can push instead of just pulling. And so this just is so much more comfortable to open. It has the same kind of sharp jimping here and you do use it, but like you don't need it. You This could actually be completely jimping free and you could still open this knife because you can simply hook onto that and push on that direction. And I love it. I, I, I'm gonna be honest, I want him to use this style of flipper or something more akin to this on all of his knives. It just works uh, better. Okay, so moving on from Pena. Let's jump over here to TRM. Three Rivers Manufacturing is hands down my favorite knife company. They make some of my absolute favorite knives, period, but they also are just my favorite knife company when it comes to the people that run it, how responsive they are to their customers, how le the level of their customer service, and how wonderful and supportive their Facebook group is. Um, I, I almost started this entire State of the Collection video with this knife because this this is the real knife that should be celebrating my one year channel anniversary because this is the knife that started my channel. Um, I've talked about this before and so I'm not going to read the whole big long story, but the bottom line is that uh, I got really, really lucky into getting one of these much earlier than other people by just coincidence. I was one of the very first regular old folks to, to order one of these. Um, and I, po I recorded an entire long video to answer people's questions about the small details of this knife and posted it in the Facebook group. And a bunch of folks, including Marianne herself, she's the owner of TRM, said, hey, you should post that to, to YouTube. And it's because of them and the encouragement that they did that it made me do that. My first video that I ever uploaded here literally is that video that I put up. Actually, my first two videos that I put on this channel are things that I shot originally for that Facebook group. And so um, part of it is that this knife will just always have that kind of nostalgic, um, sentimental quality to me. But the other thing is that this is just one of the best knives, just one of the best knives in my entire collection. This is everything as slicey as all the other TRM knives, got the same kind of blade stock, the same height of the grind. And so this is just an exceptional slicer. But where the other TRM knives are all kind of like featherweight and feel really like light and slim and flexible almost. They're not like, like they just don't feel sturdy in the same way as this. This is such a good locked in feel is so, man, everything about the ergonomics on this is amazing. And so I've been told that it's slightly blasphemous to say that this is my um, cardboard breaking down knife, but my God, like I know that that's a, maybe a lowly use case for a really hard to come by and expensive and coveted knife, but like this is the single best knife for breaking down large amounts of cardboard that I have ever experienced because you have such a good sturdy grip. It feels so comfortable when you're doing it and yet it's still got the same kind of laser beam uh, blade and that's amazing. So next up we've got my Atom. Um, the reality is, is I almost never use this because the Atom and the Neutron are there's there are subtle differences you can see like the ratio of where the screw is to that is just different on anyway but for the most part these are just the exact same knife scaled up or down and my particular hand i am a neutron hand sized person so this is this is the one that i almost always reach for but there are times where i want just a little bit more blade length and for a while the atom is also the one where you could get all of the cool contoured and fun material handles and so that's part of the reason why i still have a bunch of different uh, scales for this and i still keep this around but the other thing is like i said TRM means a lot to me, and so I will probably always keep this in my collection, even if I were to never use it ever again, but that's not the case. Uh, but the real thing coming over here, yeah, this is just one of the best EDC knives of all time, and for me, since that's my use case, this is one of the best knives of all time. I'm currently wearing the Merlot Micarta, because that's just one of my absolute favorite colors, and everything about this, this is, it really does live up to the hype you've heard. It is, it is spectacular. It is one of my most used knives and I adore it. Coming down here, what we've got is the um, same knife 
in a, a blade that has been hole modded by knife modders and in scales that are the full titanium. Let's get that focus out of glare. The full titanium scales that TRM has released recently. I did a whole video on these and the history of these and how we got to where they are, and they're just amazing. It makes the knife go from feeling slim, light, and just that kind of like really, yeah, that featherweight quality to something that feels both so much just more sturdy and kind of rigid. The extra weight makes it not heavy, but has heft in a way that's positive, but it also just makes the entire thing feel, it, go, it makes it feel not like it's a production knife anymore and just something that's way classier and higher end. And it's, it's amazing. Uh, like I said, I don't use my Atom enough to make me want to go out and attempt to get the titanium ones while they're currently still so hard to come by and so expensive. But because those are in regular production, eventually they're going to be much easier to get. And so at that point there, I will eventually pick it up because it's just such a cool thing. Lastly, one of my absolute favorite TRMs, this is the Nerd. This also was in my my tiny knife portion. So um, if you've already seen this, you've already seen it, but this is the version with the, the original version that has the thumb pad. And this is the modded version from Knife Modders that spawned the new version that's coming out soon. Um, from uh, from TRM directly, that is the version with a slot into it. And this just, especially if you want thin and light, but in general, especially now that it has the slot, it is just, I think, hands down the best small knife on the entire market. I think it's amazing. I think it's absolutely amazing. Okay, so that's all of these knives and let's move on. Okay, now we're on to what I call my monotonous sea of uh, all titanium knives. These are all production knives, um, and they are obviously all titanium. Uh, starting up here in the top, we've got the Urban EDC Supply Company Sagaya Wave Pattern version of the F5.5. The uh, F5.5 in general is an Urban EDC Supply exclusive and a large part of why I love this company. Like a large part of why a lot of people even know this company, but it's it's because they do really, really cool collabs like this, where this the F5.5 as a knife in general wouldn't have existed in the universe if it weren't for them getting together with Vox and, and creating this production knife. And so that's that I love them. I love them for doing stuff like that. And so that is why I wanted to join their ambassador program and all that kind of stuff and why I talk about them really positively because they're a really cool company. This version I think is just absolutely gorgeous. And I still also have my original one. I spent forever hunting down this Thai version. And I think, am I not focusing? I'm focusing. Yeah. I think, um, I think that's a large part of why I still have it. Like, I think that this is gorgeous, but I think that this is also gorgeous and equally so in a way that I just love the simplicity of it. And it took me so long to find it. There's no really good reason why I would have this, but I do. And, you know, to add to it, there is my third one. I like the F5.5 so much that I've got a third. But the thing is, is this is so freaking light compared to those. And the action on this version is just the best of all of them. And so that's why I justify having all three. I don't know why I justify having both of those. Okay, these are knives designed by Jesper Voxnes. And this is a knife designed by Jesper Voxnes and Jens Anso. This is the Giant Mouse Ace Biblio. And this is in so many ways a very me knife. This is uh, part, uh, this is the the, re, the later release that was a thinner full tie version. Um, the earlier ones and the ones done in Micarta are much more rounded and hand filling, but this one's thinner and lighter and all around a much more me knife. And the thing is, is I don't think I ever really use this and I have no idea why, because this is such a good, well-designed knife. There are things that I would change about it. I don't like how aggressive this lock bar jumping is. I don't like lock bar jumping in general, but I don't like how aggressive it is. And uh, I think I would. Much, I, they could have easily moved this all the way down and made this much, much deeper carry. But the, the, the action on that is so dang good. And this is an example where this one is done by MKM, but this is the kind of thing where MKM has shown that they can do a thin behind the edge, slicey grind. And so I wish that they would do that on all of the knives they make over there in Italy. It's a good example of the fact that you can do it. Now, keeping one from earlier, this was in the small knives video. This is the Giant Mouse Ace Riv, but this is kind of the like segue between these two. You know, you've got the almost the same designers here, also involved in these two as well, but these three are part of like, this is kind of the tiny, ver uh, the bigger version of that, but really it's more like a blend of the two in terms of construction. They've got the same back kind of elements going on here and there. Anyway, yeah, 
Fun, fun, fun. Okay, let's move over. These three are from Quiet Carry, and Bryce Alexander is one of my absolute favorite designers of all time, in part because of the aesthetic that he has. It's so clean and minimal and sleek, but also in part because of the ergonomics and just the general function. These knives are spectacularly designed as knives, not just as like, like aesthetic pieces of art. So first up, we have the Drift. This is in the stonewashed finish with the knurled handle. And I think all of the versions, no matter what, have a stonewashed back. And I love this knife. It's just such a good and very me knife. It's so thin. It's very heavily milled out, and so the entire thing is very light. It just feels so good in my hand, and it's got that incredibly thin blade stock, and it's in Vanex, and with LC200 and LC liner, um, or steel lock bar insert, and uh, marine grade stainless steel, everything else. So I live in Oregon, where it is wet all the time, sorry, and wow, wait, I'm holding that weird. There we go. Um, uh, it, it's wet all the time. So a knife that truly cannot rust is a very, very me knife. And the thing is, is right now, everyone says that this is their darling, but I personally still like the Waypoint more. This is, it's uh, this is an unconventional knife for to be my favorite because I typically like things with a lower down tip, and I typically like um like. I don't know, slightly shorter. This is a 3.35 inch blade, and I typically like things in the three and a quarter to three inch range, but this is just such a freaking spectacular knife. It's so thin, so light. He really does mean quiet carry when he says these things. This is so, such a deep carry, and it, this truly disappears in your pocket. And I said earlier that I think the Neutron is like one of the best EDC knives of all time. This is the other one. I think I think this is the other single best EDC knife that's ever been made. And I will stand by that. I think it is truly, truly spectacular. Love the blade stock, love the Vanex, love all of that. Coming over is my last one. This is the IQ. I did a very long video when I got to check out, oh, you got all my tape residue on this. I did no prep for this video. Anyway, I did uh, a very long video on the uh, original version I got to check out that I borrowed from a friend, and then he finally uh, re-released this version with the milled pattern, and I just had to jump on it. I think this knife is spectacular. It's smaller than the other two, but it still fits great in my hand, and it's got... It's just so different from these in a lot of different ways. It's not in Vanex. It's uh, it's a um, a bearing knife and flipper knife, and none of these are. These are both washer knives with thumb studs. And so part of it is just I really like that it feels as different as though than those. But also, man, this is that kind of like nests perfectly inside, super minimal. I, I adore it. The other reason why I knew I wanted to get this lined version is because I wanted to be able to do. Let's get these all open up. I wanted to be able to do this three-way comparison. And you know, I don't think I ever actually put this up on the channel, but it turns so that's actually on screen at the same time. This is, there's, there's just like such a clear continuation between these knives. There's so many things that they all have in common and there's such an interesting comparison. Um, what we have, what we're looking at now, let me put this away for a sec, is the, Tactile Knife Company Rockwall in the flipper tab version, and then over here, this is the thumb stud version. And so these are effectively the same knife as each other, but one is a flipper, one is a thumb stud. Um, I have a, a mixed feels about this knife because uh, honestly, most people are saying that they think the thumb stud version is their favorite. And of the two, I think the fact that I can like reverse flick it and everything like that, I think I get why they're saying that, but I am, I take issue with how this is designed, and the reason, the real reason why I still keep this around is because I, I want to make a video of all about how this is implemented and why I think it could be done better. Um, but so much about these knives are so well done that I don't want to make it seem like I'm throwing any kind of shade against tactile because they've, they've absolutely nailed some parts of these and other things I think they genuinely should change. And so part of what I want to do is just make a video about that. And I don't know when I'll finally find the time. I did have, um, I did have uh, QC issues. I had to send both of these separately back to the mothership, but I want to say right now that they um, made it very easy to do that and they uh, completely fixed it and um, took, you know, no questions asked. The warranty program worked really, really well. It sucks to have to use a warranty program, but I'm really glad that they responded in a way that was positive. Next up is the Kaiser Genie. Um, this is 
just a really cool knife, but also an example of how you can get a lot of really high-end features in something that's very, very budget. So this isn't like so budget that it's like 50 bucks kind of thing. I think this is maybe 150, 120. I honestly don't remember. It's over 100, but it's low priced for all the things you're getting. This is a full tie frame lock with wild, absolutely wild amounts of skeletonization, insanely skeletonized to the point where this is absolutely featherweight. And then it's got like a detent ball ramp and it's got the kind of action where this this knife just free falls of its own weight, and that's on a very thin blade. And so everything about this is just really, really cool. Um, the, the other thing that I want to do at some point is film a comparison between this and my brown knives Cortex, um, because they just do have a lot of similarity, and a lot of people have considered this like a budget Cortex. And there's some degree to which that is totally valid, and some degree to which that there is so much different when you end up getting a ultra high-end knife like the Cortex. I unfortunately do not have my Cortex with me. We'll get to that when we get to that part of the video. It is still on loan. But this is just a really neat knife. Um, moving over, so this is the tie portion of my Monterey Bay Knives collection. I already showed earlier my Micarta Easy C 1.5 and the Slayback. So this right here is the Slayback. It's got the ZDP 189 and 420J blanketed thing, and I bought this because I love this so much, it's the same knife, I just thought I would use it, um, and I love the color of my Carta, but I, I, I honestly kind of forget that I own this just because I always reach for this, because I love this knife so freaking much. This is the Slayback, the flipper version, they call it, which is kind of a misnomer because both versions have a flipper. Again, that same ZDP 189 that just keeps an edge forever. It's crazy. And then the 420J blanket for um, corrosion resistance and strength and everything. And this is just such a spectacular blade shape. I know it looks kind of weird to people, but it's so good for EDC uses. It is so good for box cutting, for getting into little corners, for cutting small details around stuff. I use this all the time. I absolutely love it. And like I said, I own three now, three different versions of the Slayback because this is the original Slayback. It doesn't have a standard flipper tab, so they call that the flipper, but this absolutely has a flipper tab. It's right there. So one of the reasons why I keep this around, uh, and part of the reason why I got it in the first place, is because it implements double detents differently than other double detent knives. They just, it, it uses a different approach, and one of the things about it is that it doesn't have two detent balls. There's only a single liner spring in here with a single detent ball, but that's part of the whole, what does it even mean to be a double detent? Because it does use two different detent locations. It has two different spots where it's using a detent ball to hold it open. It also has one of the best of that kind of like flicking thing going on, but it also has one of the, the strongest breaks up here. And so I think this is just a really good example of how to do a double detent right. The other reason why I keep it around is because, oh my God, look at this. This flipper tab is so good. This is what people think of a flipper tab. And yes, this has tremendously good snappy action, but look, it just kind of sticks out there and gets in the way. And this is an example of how it doesn't need to be like that. Look at this. This is so cool. This this is the kind of flipper tab that's so far forward and, and leaning upward like this that it, it is completely out of the way, but you get such good traction and grip here and you're maintaining pressure for so long. Like the blade is almost entirely open while you're still be able to push on that. By comparison, if we look over this, this is how far the blade is open when I'm no longer able to touch that. That compared to that. And so you get such a freaking good flip on this. Oh, man, this, so I keep this around as an example of how alternative flipper tap designs they're just better. They're just better. Okay, so last up we've got the Monterey Bay Knives Mini Old Guard in the inset liner lock. I think this is probably the best implementation of the Old Guard yet. I think it's it's just genuinely really, really good. Um, and for my hands, the Mini is perfect. I think aesthetically, like the reason I got this is because I wanted to check it out, because this aesthetically is, I think, just a gorgeous knife and a really, really good example of minimalist design that's just beautiful and ergonomically really, really well done. Um, and one of the reasons why this doesn't have Ray Laconico on it is because this is a collaboration between Ray Laconico and Sanford Owens. It's part of what part of what kicked off Monterey Bay Nice. Um, and so it, it's something he doesn't really get much uh, uh, um, credit for. Uh, people usually refer to this still as a Laconico knife, and I often even do that. And I guess because it does have such Laconico-y qualities to it. Um, 
I'm probably going to end up selling this at some point just because I just don't really need it in my collection. It is a full tie washer based knife with thumb studs and I just, yeah, it's, it's kind of thicker and heavier and since that's not something that I normally go for, I, would, I almost always reach for this instead. And I know they're pretty different, but yeah, for my use cases, but man, this really is done great. The access, the lock bar here, everything about this is just, it's really, really well done. I just never end up reaching for it. I got it mostly and I keep it around mostly because it's very pretty looking. Okay, that is all of these knives. Let's move on to the next set. Okay, so now we're on to the portion of my collection that are, I guess what I would call these is designer knives that are made by an OEM. So in some cases, these are knives that are made by a person who is only a knife designer. And sometimes these are production versions of knives who are someone who is themselves a custom knife maker. But all of these are by someone, <laughs> like a specific name that you've heard of, not just an in-house design, and they're made by some or an overseas OEM. I think almost all of these, all of these except this one are made in China. Okay, so first up we have, this is the Luft Concepts Avant. This is Jake, AKA Bearded Gear, and Ryan Rimmer, AKA Rimmer Design. This is the, their collaboration knife. Uh, they are friends of mine, and this knife is one of those knives that a lot of people think is weird looking, and other people think it is gorgeous, but it's one of those knives that once you get it in hand, you go like, oh wow, this makes sense ergonomically. I think this knife is great. I, 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 I love using this knife. And it's just also incredibly cool to get to see um, my, you know, a friend of mine actually create a knife company. Next up we've got, this is a newer acquisition of mine. This is the uh, Philippe Georges 520 from Custom Knife Factory. I don't think the unboxing for this has made it onto the channel yet. Uh, I'm also not entirely sure I even filmed an unboxing. We'll see, I think I did. And the action on this is incredible. It is. Yeah, this is something I've always wanted to check out. I've heard some mixed things about, oh man, yeah, you can finger flick off that. I've heard some mixed things about some of the other versions of this, like the bolster lock version that's just thicker and has a lighter detent, but this full frame lock version is just perfectly snappy and so delightful. Um, next up, we've got the Richard Rogers OEM Slim Utility. This is a knife that I hunted for for a really long time. No, actually I didn't. I hunted for a really long time and then I gave up and I completely forgot about it because I just thought I wasn't going to willing to pay the hype pricing on this. And then my friend Kevin hooked me up with the opportunity to get one of these um, from Sally herself, Sally Rogers. And this is uh, honestly one of my absolute favorite knives. And it, it's interesting. I'm going to do a full video on this at some point because it, what, it's interesting that this is one of my favorites because it breaks some of my rules. Like this is a cardinal sin for me, having a backspacer that sticks up proud and, and puts all of the weight on a, on a small little spot right there. I don't like lanyards, period, let alone that way. And this has a very late engagement for the, the detent ball. But everything else about this, just it like the way it actually works makes those things moot. Like this is uh, rounded in a way that feels delightful in my hand despite that. And this is such a good snappy action and it falls to my nail in a way that I don't, I just, I don't ever, I don't ever care where the detent engagement is. And it's just so, such a mean knife. So slim, so light. I adore this thing. Moving on, we've got Dylan Mallory is just a really cool human and a really cool designer. This is my only knife from him and it is the Forest. This is the first time that he had a knife under his own brand. His, his knives have been through other folks like Artisan before and this is the first time that it was something that he did part for just for him. And I think it is such a cool looking knife. And it's also one of those knives that um, can fit someone like my hands really, really comfortably, despite how much extra blade there is, I mean, a handle there is, and it can fit people bigger too. And it's just a really, it's just a really cool knife. Okay. Next up, this is something that I wanted to experience for a really long time, but I never picked one up because I knew back then I was really, really dead set on knives being just things that I would carry around and use. And this is such a steampunky, cyberpunky looking, yeah, cyberpunk, not steampunk, uh, looking knife that I didn't think I would actually use this. And, but I always wanted to check it out because I think it's really, really cool looking. But the bigger thing is that Snex is a freaking mad scientist genius. And compared to the original Hoback production version of this, this is actually an authentic recreation of Snex's detent pin. So this is doing a really interesting detent system. And I'll do an entire video on this, but it's so freaking cool. It has a, a, a very carefully milled pin that is acting as the lockup, both like as the way like a Chris Reeves knives 
uh, Sebenza 31 is doing, where the detent ball is the, the lock face engagement, but it also has a milled ramp, and so the action feels kind of like a sharp eye design style like detent nub, where it has a constant flow. Everything about this is just so freaking cool. I love the action. And it's just such a freaking neat knife. I love, I love snacks. Can't wait for the production version of Vision to come out. Next up, this was in the mini knives video, but I'm bringing it back out because it fits this category perfectly. This is the Berg Blades Slim Mini. This is a absolute chonk nugget of a knife and I adore it. This one is uh, part of the production versions that he had made by Wii. And it's just, yeah, you can see in there, Berg Blades. Oh, man, it's just such a cool little stout chonk knife. I, I don't know why, but those things, I, I absolutely love them. I actually mused all about why I think I love them in the video for that. And I think it's basically because they're just kind of an exaggerated caricature of what I love in a sheep's foot or reverse tanto blade. And that's why we I, I adore the heck out of this. So this is the um, EMP EDC Thick Boy, and it is another chonk knife. And it's funny because like, this is actually thicker and this one's called a slim and this one's thinner and it's called a thick. But man, I I love the way that this works. It's just so fun to see this, to feel this giant chunk of steel uh, fly up into your hand and it falls in that really kind of satisfying, just clunk way. And it's just, it's, ooh, I almost dropped it. Holy crap, that would have been bad. It is, it's just incredibly fun. Doing stuff under a camera is dangerous. Anyway, it is just so fun. But the thing about it is that I still can't get used to the feeling of this big nub right there. And so I don't really use this very much. This is mostly just a fun for me fidget toy. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's just it, some knives. This is, this is part of my collection where I got to the point where it's, it's, I'm, I'm permitting myself to just have fun. And it doesn't have to be a knife I would use all the time. The reality is this is actually a very, very good slicer. Uh, what that brings us to here is the EMP EDC Nimble. This is one of the um, the second generation and in the frag pattern and, and the uh, stonewash. And uh, I, I'm keeping this around still because there's part of me that really wants to make a video about this because this is everyone's in, uh, darling knife. And on the one hand, I get it. I think this so some parts of this are exceptionally well done, but there's also stuff about this that I just don't like or think is like deficient because of the way that other things had to fit in. And so, I don't know, part of me, part of me is feels... It, it just feels bad saying anything negative about a knife that people absolutely love. And I also think that the guy who makes this is a really, really cool guy. Everything I've ever seen about him, he's so like talkative and genuine and friendly, and he is so ambitious. I, I think he's a really cool guy, um, but this just is not my favorite knife. And a large part of it also is that I cannot get over the feeling of having that in my fingers. Um, the chimping done here is done in a really interesting way where it's aggressive in this direction, but smooth in that direction. It's really, there's some neat stuff happening here, but ultimately I do intend to sell that knife. Next up, we have a Sharp by Designs uh, Mini Tempest. I think that's what this is called. Uh, screw you, Brian, for calling a 3.5 inch knife mini. I said that in my, my video for this as well, but this is such a freaking good knife. Brian, you really understand how to make knives. I, I get it. I get it. I get why everyone talks so highly of you. Um, the reason why I wanted to get this knife is because I have always, sorry, really doing stuff under camera, uh, especially with all of this stuff here. Um, I've always really wanted to experience Brian's original detent nub design. I have have had some Holt knives that have a similar implementation of a, of a milled platform detent nub, but it's just different on Brian's. And this is of course a production um, version that is not the same thing as, as Brian's OG customs, but it's um, a much more faithful representation. And it's just, it's very, it's it's got a very soft, kind of detent where it feels like it's it's snappy but like in a delicate way it's gentle it's fun anyway this is a gorgeous knife and it's also a knife that taught me that a three and a half inch blade can somehow fit in my hand if you manage to have fantastic uh, blade to handle ratios. And this is, yeah, I think everything about this just shows that Brian really knows how to design knives. Next up we've got the Sham Weary. So this is the Wii production version of the Sham Wari. And I honestly don't know why I keep this knife. I think I think it's one of the prettiest looking knives. I think it's really, really a me aesthetic. And I think it feels spectacular in my hand, but I've never once used it. I'm not going to use it. And I think, I think I'm just going to sell it. And the reason is because it's it is the most front flipper only front flipper I own. Like every other thing I have that is a front flipper 
can be flicked in some way, and you just can't. This is this is exclusively a front flipper, and even though it does work well as a front flipper, I just I'm not gonna I'm just not gonna enjoy carrying a front flipper only knife all that much. And since I know that these are really hard to come by, and this one is in pristine like new unboxing edition, I'll probably just gonna end up selling this at some point. But it is just gorgeous. The other thing about if you're gonna do a front flipper, this is not my favorite kind of front flipper because it's the kind that's so low down that you're really relying just on traction. And if you look at the angle you're going to push, and you're going to be pushing out instead of along. Um, and so your your action, your thumb flick is going to be that way as opposed to this way. And so it's harder to do follow through. You kind of have to interrupt yourself part way and flick in this kind of curled motion, which is just not as easy. And so I just don't think that this is like the best possible front flipper. And I don't know. Anyway, it's a really gorgeous looking knife. I get why people love it. Um, next up, this is the only one that's kind of an odd one out because it's technically a production knife from Millet Knives, but I'm counting it in this category because Millet is themselves an OEM and they're one of the very few American OEMs. And this is a design by um, TJ Schwartz. And so this is the Millet Torrent. And this is a special, very rare, there's only 10 of these, uh, limited version where they did a, where they transitioned from the V2 to the V3. So this is a V2, uh, V2 show scale where they've got the like shadow boxed inlay style, uh, but overlay, I guess you'd call it style, uh, handle up here. And then the uh, V3 style of milling on the back. And so this is the, they're like different thicknesses. The whole knife is just a very strange, like intentional Frankenstein of a knife. And it is just a really cool knife. Um, I've, I've wanted a torrent for ages because I think it's so cool. And this is such a, a neat and beautiful version of it. I think this is just an aesthetically gorgeous knife. And one of the reasons why I think TJ Schwartz is a pretty cool guy. Um, next up, this is the, whoops, the Boos Blades, uh, smoke mini. I always want to put the mini first because it's how grammar works, you'd say a mini item, but this this is this is the Boost Blade Smoke Mini. And this is a good example of what I mean when I say most front flippers I have, that even if they're good front flippers, um, most front flippers I have have some other kind of opening mechanism. And that's what I prefer using this knife for is the middle finger flick. And it's just such a good middle finger flick. I keep this knife around um, because I think it's spectacular, but also because this is just such a freaking insane knife. This thing is like 1.4 ounces or something like that. And for like a three inch blade, I don't remember all the specs, but the point is, is that the blade to handle ratio on this is insane. Absolutely insane. It is so light. It's also, I think just a really good example of a, like a, a, um, a well thought out and cohesive design because there's, there's so many things here that, that kind of mirror each other. So like there's three facets on the back that mirror the three lines here that mirror the three corners of the pivot. This shape here mirrors this cutout here. Everything about this knife is just kind of a good a good example of cohesive design and i think the folks the guy over at boost blades i don't know his first name is just i think he's, he i think he makes gorgeous knives and this knife is the perfect like gentleman's carry box cutter um like office knife it is just so freaking cool and on a proper flick oh i love it okay the last one up here is the picaroon tools mutineer this is a relatively new knife that i acquired um, and it is, I, I went from not knowing this knife existed to buying it within like uh, a couple hours. And I got this off of my friend, Kevin left EDC. And I got this cause this is just a super me looking knife. I love Warren Cliffs. I love sleek designs. I love knives that have a kind of a, some amount of like spot for you to put your finger in and a pinch grip. And this is, I think just an exceptionally done knife. The action on it is so good. The overall fit and finish is some of the best work I've ever seen come out of Best Tech, and it's just such a good EDC blade shape. Um, I still have not carried this knife or cut anything with it because I was going to sell it to a, a guy and he was um, having issues with PayPal and all this kind of stuff, and so I kind of just put it aside and uh, didn't use it because I figured someone like I wanted to buy it. Things kind of fell through there and I don't know. I Maybe I'll pick this back up and start using this knife again. I actually acquired something that you'll see in the next segment. I think it's the next segment. I think that's where we're at. We're running more towards the end. Um, that makes this, I think, completely moot though, which is why I'm probably still going to sell it. Um, okay, that is everything in this set. And I think I think what's left is just the the high-end pieces. We'll get there. 
Okay, this is it. This is the end of the line. This is the top of my collection, but there are actually two things that are missing from this table. I'll talk about those when I get there. Everything here is either like the absolute high end of production knives or things that you would consider a custom in the, at least the CNC custom space. So first up we have an Elamic Cutlery Whippersnapper. This one is uh, so I, I think Alamic makes really, really, really cool knives, and I've always loved the Whippersnapper, I, and I wanted something that I thought would be a true user for me, and so I got something that would be a uh, a relatively neutral finish. I kind of wanted a stonewash, but this is like a bronze stonewash. This is actually a combination of like an orange peel and a stonewash that they call a... Uh, I don't remember what they call it. Tex wash. That's what they call that. And this is in their like earth color. Um, but the thing is, is I very quickly realized that the geometry of this blade does not make sense for me in my EDC case use cases. So this has, um, a, it's just a thick enough blade that if I were to get one of these, I got to experience the uh, what they call the sheep's foot version, and I just think that that one cuts better. It just does. And so I realized that I was actually going to be hunting for a sheep's foot version of this to keep. And so I, I've kept this around around until I get that one, but I will eventually let this go uh, once I pick that up. But the reality is, I realized just now as I'm saying this out loud, that there is a third knife that's not on this table because I don't have it yet, but... I actually got my first true ever custom to me custom knife, or am getting my first ever, um, and that is something I don't know. I think I want to keep that as a total surprise until I get to the end, uh, until I actually get that in hand. But that is, um, it's. Let's just say I'm bringing it up right now because it is filling the need in my mind for the kind of it, the blade shape on it is reminiscent of the sheep's foot worn uh, sheep foot whippersnapper. So my other uh, alamic, this one came up earlier in the night in the video from my small knives collection. Um, this is the busker. I think it's such a weird looking knife, but in the best kind of ways. This is an example of how weird looking design can be exceptionally ergonomic. It is just such a perfect like utility knife blade i, I the, everything about this is spectacular um i i think the reason why i keep this a run around is because i just haven't found the replacement for it i'm constantly searching the aftermarkets for for the secondary markets for a version that i would like better but the thing is is their whole motto is never the same and so they're all so different and i just haven't found the perfect one for me and what makes this one not the perfect one for me is i don't personally like the dry texture of their dark blast, uh, sand blasting finish. Okay, next over we've got, this is one of my favorite knives, period. This is so, oh, this is so gorgeous. This is the Trevor Burger Knives LEXK in the sheep's foot handle with a, a dark matter fat carbon uh, in the red color. And this is just... Oh my God. So this is a custom knife from South African custom knife maker, Trevor Berger. And this is so good. Everything about this is like insanely glassy smooth. And it is so good and easy to reverse flick off of that blade grind right there. The hollow grind on this is spectacular. It feels so good in my hand. It works so good as a utility knife. I love this knife. I cannot say enough nice things about this knife. Trevor Berger makes just astonishingly good stuff. And I'm so glad I got to pick this up and add it to my collection. Love it, love it, love it. Brings us to this. This is another knife I bought off of Casper. This is one of the custom versions of the Trevor Burger Urban, also sometimes known as the Urban SFL for a flat slab, slab, there we go, slab frame lock. Um, and this is a, so so he, st he did the Urban EDC LC. He, he got together with Urban EDC the same way that they got together with um, other makers like the to create like like uh, Chris Taylor to make the Nessie or um, Vox to make the F5.5. They got together with Trevor Berger to make a truly uh, exclusive to them production knife. And so this started as a production knife design, but he liked the design so much that he made a small number of customs. And I originally passed on that opportunity to get in on that initial set of 50. Um, and the reason is because of this. I said earlier on the Richard Rogers OEM Slim Utility that this is a, a cardinal sin for me, that having the backspacer 
stick out proud in order to add a lanyard hole, which I don't want in the first place, and make it so that this puts the pressure on a thinner spot in the back of your hand. But um, my friend Casper ended up saying that he wanted to move it along, and so I I bought it off him, and I am so freaking glad that I did because this is now one of my absolute favorite knives, period. I don't mind this at all. I think it feels great in my hand. Everything about this just fits me so well. The action is so good. You can absolutely flick it off of that grind. This thing is just spectacular. And so I'm very soon going to get to check out the, um, the, the, what this was always meant to be, the production version for Urban ADC. And I cannot wait because I have such, such high hopes. And the thing that I'm confident will not be the same is, well, first of all, they chose to go with a flat grind. And I, I, from a, from a cutting perspective, I don't think it matters that much. This, this hollow grind is so thin and so gorgeous that this, this slice is great for a lot of uses, but the, a, a tall flat grind is going to be a, a fantastic slicer. The bigger thing is that it just feels kind of blasphemous to me to do it because Trevor Burger's knives have always had hollow grinds as far as I know, like as far back as I've ever seen everyone I've ever seen dating back 20 years. But the other thing is that I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm really looking forward to seeing and seeing how it feels is I think the other thing that makes a Trevor Burger custom feel so custom is that this is just absurdly glassy smooth. And I, I will be surprised to see if they can come anywhere close to feeling like that. Okay, moving back to production space, we've got two different Shirogorov knives. These are two different versions of the Shirogorov Neon. This is the original version, which oddly had a suffix. This is the, the Shiro Neon Light. And they started with the light version. And the irony is that the light version um, doesn't have the internal milling that would make it lighter. And I mean, it is L-I-T-E, but whatever, they're Russian. And it has spots in here that you would see that could be milled out, but they didn't do it back then. And so later they released the Shiro Neon uh, Zero, and that version had internal milling. And you can see what that milling would look like. I don't know, maybe it's not going to show up super well, but they milled out those spots that they put in here. These They just outlined them. This is the Neon R20, so it's a limited edition version of the Neon Zero, but it has the exact same frame as this. I originally bought this as a birthday present to myself, I think, last year, maybe the year before that. I don't remember. I bought this as a birthday present to myself. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I bought this as a birthday present to myself right before I started the channel. And this was like me permitting myself to splurge on something that is very, very high end and that I really, really wanted. But then literally a day later, I found this version that I'd also been hunting for and I just bought both. And my expectation is that I would sell the one I liked least, but I love them both and they're both so good and they're both just different. And I think it's also really cool to be able to see that kind of evolutionary change because what's different about these knives Oh man, the action on these. If you've never handled a um, a Shiro, they've got this kind of just float home version of Freefall that is amazing. But the difference between these is really, really cool. So one of the things I really want to make a video about is what actually changed between these models. It's subtle, but it's definitely meaningful. And one of the big things is they extended that backspacer out to make it so that the blade to handle ratio is so crazy. The blade actually sticks out further than the handle, but it's completely encapsulated in there. And so it's just uh, an exercise in, in kind of maximizing a design that was already spectacular. This is, I think, a good example of kind of the highest end that production knives can feel. Um, and, and I know there's other things that kind of match that, but nothing really beats Shurigorov's quality for production. Um, the, the next up we've got, this is the, the, the first like gateway into getting nice knives. This is the uh, Brad Southard Mini Tulk, and this is the first time that I let myself spend big money on a knife that is just spectacular. You know, I wanted to see what happens if you spend that kind of money on a custom-made knife, and this thing is just, it blew my mind. It, it, it opened my eyes to what knives can be, and then that kind of, that was the, the thing that really sunk me and said, okay, I guess I'm doing this forever because I am obsessed with this now. Look at the micro milling on this. This has this subtle blue anodization that's kind of just hazy up here and a little bit stronger down there. The clip is so gorgeous. This is 
such a beautiful knife. And it's, a, an, on one hand, a really good EDC knife from a utility perspective, but it's really good for utility cuts. It's such thick blade stock, and it's, it was originally thick behind the edge. This particular one that I bought on secondary has been, had the, the edge laid back to be more slicey. Um, but this is not actually the best slicer because it, it is such a thick blade stock. But it slices pretty darn well, but I have since gotten knives that uh, cut through material is a lot better, but in terms of something you could use the tip for in order to pull on, this just feels so good, again, in that kind of pinch grip. I, I love Brad's knives, and I have always been hunting for one of the ones with like a Koa inlay. And so I said that this was the knife that I kind of splurged on and treated myself to for my birthday last year. I probably should hold this to the end, but I'm just going to do it right now because it's what's next in line. This is what I got myself as a birthday present this year, and this is my true be all end all grail. Like if I ever had a grail, it was this. I don't normally consider myself as someone that has a grail per se, per se, yeah, per se but this is, this was it. If anyone asked me like, what is your grail? This is what I told people. And I got it. <laughs> I'm going to go from here. This is a Peter Rosenti Paizon 2.0 or Paizon 2.0. This is uh, um, the small Paizon. And this thing is stunning. This is a completely custom, handmade, integral knife, and this is just a masterpiece. One of the things I think is so cool about this is that it has a hidden stop pin right there. It's right there underneath, and it's not, like, how do you get a stop pin in an integral knife? Most integral knives will have some either just additional hole that you can see that they screw in. There's like it's just a screw sitting right there. Or they'll have a weirdly sized uh, pivot collar that comes up and covers up a spot and holds it in. Um, but this, it just feels like magic. Where'd it go? And the reality is, it's right there. Yeah, they stuck it in the side right there. It's press fit in and it's just invisible because of how perfectly this is finished. And that in the stone wash they did afterward just covers it up to the point where it's almost impossible to tell that there is a post going in right there. The action on this is amazing. It feels so good in my hand. The hollow grind in this is absurd. This comes down to, I think I measured this at six, six thousandths behind the edge. And ah, uh, it is so comfortable in my hand. And this kind of what I thought would be a weird grip where I'm just kind of pinching right there and then nestling that right there, or I can choke down and this is so good. I, I am just blown away by this knife. Um, I have a full unboxing coming up to the channel pretty soon. I think this, this video is going to go up before that, but we'll see. I, I am just blown away. I'm just blown away. And, oh wait, I got to grab something. Yes. I started this video with this. And one of the reasons why I love this blade shape so much is because it's just so incredibly similar to this blade shape. And I don't mean that in like it's a copying way. I mean that in like they both have the exact same qualities that I love so much about a a like a sheep's foot blade with a place to put your finger. I adore it. I adore it. I adore it. Okay, I'm going to skip that one for now because that's one of the that leads into one of the things that's not on the table. Let's come down here. This is a. Koenig Arius, and this is not going to stick around. I just happen to have this right now. I was able to get it off of a friend, and I've always wanted to check one out, but the reality is, is it is just too big for me, just outright too big for me. But the other reality is there's certain things about, this is a brand new version. This is a Gen 4 Batch 9 made in March of this year, and uh, this one's like new in box, and is, as, as like impressive as a lot of aspects of this knife are, I totally get why people love it. I also think that the detent system is just designed in a way that I, I think should be different. And so I will probably make a video about that, but I'm going to be, I'm a, this is another one of those ones that makes me a little bit scared to make the video because this is such a beloved knife and this is so many people's favorite knife of all time. I kind of think people might get a little bit mean to me, uh, but no, I have to talk to people about it because I just genuinely think it should be designed slightly differently. Um, but I get, I get it. I get why people love this so much. And for a lot of reasons, this thing is, is, it is tremendously cool. Um, but it's definitely not for me. So this will be moving along. Um, Please do not contact me asking if you can buy it because I'd say there's very high odds about the time this video goes up that it has already been sold. Um, 
but yeah, I just kind of anticipate that happening. Anyway, moving on, this is one of my favorite knives. Oh my God, that's so freaking cool. This is the Herman Knives Vespertilio. Uh, everything about this is stunning. This is one with a polished dark matter fat carbon. Just to give you a, a sense of what that, like that's the same material and it looks so incredibly different over there. Um, I think this is just one of the coolest things ever. It has a very subtly blue anodization here that I think is really neat and reminiscent of this knife that also has a subtle blue anno. And this is just, you know, it's a battering knife and it is so freaking cool. And I love this. The sounds this knife makes is just wild. It is insane. I just think it, I don't know. I, I, aesthetically, this is one of the coolest looking knives. But to me, this is a knife that I keep around because of the aesthetic I keep, and the, the auditory quality. I think this to me is an experience knife and I don't actually use it. Um, I could, this is a totally usable knife. It's actually super comfortable to use. It's got a really great uh, blade that's super duper thin and slicey and it would certainly work really well. And I have cut with it, um, but I just, I keep it around because this is something that I think is like kind of art to me. It's it's a pointier than I want in a knife that I would actually carry around and take out in front of people. It's kind of intimidating looking because of that. But it's this kind of thing where like, I want this in my collection because it is just so cool. <laughs> I just, it tickles that part of my brain from like how like mechanically it's working in order to make those sounds and have this behavior. And also just it tickles the part of my brain that grew up as a comic book nerd and loved Batman and thinks that this just looks badass. So that's why that sticks around. Um, this is also Herman Nice. This is the Sting. So once I had the Vespertilio and realized how much I loved that, I was like, wait a minute, I think I want to get one of these um, these ones that is a little bit more of a me type of knife. And this is, in so many ways, a very me knife. Yeah, the funny thing is, is I think I'm probably going to sell this. And I think I'm going to sell it to my friend Casper if he actually wants it. He's kind of on the fence. I don't know, we'll find out. And the reason why I think I'm going to sell it is just because it is doing the same things as this for me. The reality, actually, the reality is, I want to sell a lot of my knives, and um, th what I and so this is an expensive knife, and I could I could use the money from this to check out a couple other things. You know, like I could check out two or three knives for the price of this. And since what this is doing for me is a lot of the same kind of like like auditory and kind of milling ex exceptional quality visual thing. I think I think ultimately I just don't need to have both. I think everything that I'm getting from this, I'm getting from this. I don't know, we'll see. Uh, this does have just a stunningly gorgeous pivot. The milling on this, everything about this is spectacular. I don't know, maybe I'll change my mind. Okay, where are we are? Last one on the table. This is my... Holt Haptic. And this is, I think, one of my favorite knives. I think it's just one of the coolest knives ever made. And I own, I like it so much that I actually own two of these. And the other one is, it's coming back to me really soon, actually, but it is on loan to um, Marco, aka Knives of the Roundtable. Go check his channel out. He has an amazing collection. He's just a really cool guy. And so I I scored this in a drop, one of, the, one of their actual drops. And um, this is the most me version that was in that drop. <laughs> and so I I got the one that I that didn't have anodization on the the clip or the hardware because those are the things that are most likely to get scratched and I wanted it to be a user knife I do use this knife but I baby the heck out of it because of this anod job and so I really only carry it around the house and I do it for really light stuff and I'm very careful with it and that uh, that bugs me it bugs me that I feel apprehensive about it but it's just so freaking pretty and so the entire time I continued hunting for what I actually wanted from the get-go which was a nude one and I finally found a nude one and the nude one is perfect for me it is it is a knife that I I mean I haven't had it very long and I pretty quickly shipped it off to my friend to go check out um, but I every time I reached for it, I was like yeah I don't feel bad about it I, I know it's an incredibly expensive knife and so a lot of people would feel very nervous about that but I'm I'm fortunate enough to have indoctrinated myself into unfortunate maybe enough to indoctrinate myself into the the pricey knife game that I was able to reach for it and just feel just good and so I'm 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 not sure how much longer I'll keep this around but the reality is, is right now as you've seen from the entirety of my collection this is my only gorgeous 
use Anno knife. And something that doesn't show up on camera anywhere near as well as it does in real life is that at an angle, this is a secret blur bowl. So it's, it's vivid blue from the front and from the side, it is like neon purple. And so that in and of itself is also so freaking interesting and cool to me from like a science perspective, like the refractive quality of the surface of anodization when you, and just everything about tie anodization, the fact that it's electricity based, all of it is so freaking cool. And so this is currently still sticking around in my collection as my only example of a gorgeous anodization knife. And I don't know, I don't know if I ever pick up another gorgeous anodization knife, which I just don't really ever do. Maybe that would be the thing that finally shakes this loose. But uh, yeah, so I do have a second one of these that is just not in right now. And the other knife that's not sitting here either is the other knife that is on loan to Marco. It's the send them both of them at the exact same time. And that is my brown knives cortex. I still have that knife. It is a really, really cool knife. I have a very long video taking it apart and showing the inside of it and everything like that. So if you want to check that out, check it out on my channel. Um, it is a long knife and it is. Um, it is similar in shape and size and everything to this knife. And so it's, imagine if this knife were a ultra high end, ultra, you know, precision CNC custom made by a dude in America. It's, it's kind of like that. And it has a really, really neat flipper tab design that is like a top hybrid kind of like a regular flipper, kind of like a top flipper, and it hides inside. It's just a really, it's a really freaking cool knife. I got it because of that that novel flipper tab implementation and all just because it looks so cool and it sticks around for those exact same reasons. Um, I think that's it. I think this is everything. I I literally like walked around my house trying to see if there were knives laying around anywhere and I might have forgotten something in this huge long sea, but I think that's everything. Um, I haven't looked at how long these individual segments are, and I don't know how long it's going to add up to. I might split into two. Yeah, I don't know. But I've uploaded some absurdly long videos to this channel already, so maybe I won't. At the end of the day, I am tired of talking. My voice is sore. Uh, and um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. I, I find these very fun. I love getting to see what people have, hear why they have them, and especially hear why they're sticking around. I Now that I've made this video... I think this is going to be a cathartic experience that lets me kind of let go of some of these because there's a, there's a fair number of knives in my collection that I don't really use at all. And I'm trying to not be, I, I, don't, I don't want to be a, a hoarder of it by any means. I also don't really, as, okay, as, as a knife YouTuber, which I guess I am, um, I've been doing it for a year now, holy crap. But as a knife YouTuber, especially as someone who makes content that is trying to be kind of like detail oriented and explanatory and slightly in the educational space, I feel a strong kind of urge to have a, like a, a uh, like a, uh, a library of examples. And so I said, there's some things that I have in here because there's like, I, I own that little native because it's, I wanted to have an example of a compression lock in my collection. And, um, that kind of mentality is like, I, like I said, I never use that Biblio. It's such a good knife. Someone should really use it. Someone should enjoy it. But I keep it around partly because it's an example of the, the, like the kind of transition between the F5.5, which I adore and the Riv, which I adore. And then it also is a really good example of how uh, Italian made knives can be a very good thin slicing knives. They don't have to be thick and chunky and thick behind the edge. And so there's little things like that where I keep it around as an example. And I want to do that less and less. I want to, uh, what's the word I want? Winnow? Yeah, I guess that could be a word. I want to narrow down my collection and make it so that I'm really kind of only hanging on to things that I care about and especially things that I use. And um, I think. I think I just need to let go of that in that sensation that I want. That I have to keep it in order to make a video on it because at the end of the day, some things just aren't novel enough for them to ever rise to the top above all of the other demands and, and, and actually get a full video. And that's not a slight against them. They're sometimes fantastic knives like that. Uh, that mini old guard, the inset lock. That's a fantastic knife. It's just not doing anything novel enough that I, me, on my nerdery channel, want to or should make a video about it. And so I think, I think now that I finally have included it in a video, I think I probably will finally let myself let it go. <laughs> so it'll be really interesting what my collection will look like the next time I do one of these. I don't know how frequently I'm going to ever do this again because it's just taking me forever, but, um, 
yeah, maybe there'll be a lot of the same things. Maybe half of the things will be gone. I'm pretty confident these will be gone at some point. They might be replaced with alternative versions of them. Um, I might eventually let go of one of these. I might sell that to my friend. Um, I might eventually sell that based on if I ever get another Anno knife. And then I know for sure I'm going to sell that because it doesn't fit my hand. But as far as the collection as a whole, yeah, I think I think I just need to start purging. But I I love these knives, and it's really hard to let go of things that you think are really cool. So anyway, thank you for listening to me ramble. Thank you for watching. Thank you for guys for just supporting me for an entire year and nerding out with me. It's been it's been really freaking cool. So yeah, this has been amazing. Thank you everyone for all your support. And uh, yeah, I'll catch you guys more and many more videos to come. <laughs> Bye.